Good afternoon. Sorry about all the beeps as we let more people into the uh, the webinar, but it's it's very exciting to have everyone here today for the release of the 2003 community checkup. Uh, you see on the screen right now just some highlights, and we'll talk about those as we uh, go go through uh, today's session. Uh, I did did want to note that um, we're very happy that uh, uh, Genentech has helped sponsor um, you know this event and, and sponsor the alliance and a number of different uh, things over the last um, uh, couple of years, and um, really want to. Um, uh, express our gratitude for that. But let's go into uh, what we'll talk about today. And uh, this will be the 17th uh, community uh, checkup report. And uh, it's been over 15 years. Um, we'll talk about quality. How does quality on our quality uh, measures compare nationally? We'll talk about something that was new last year, uh, the total cost of care results. Uh, but also, what we really want to get into a little bit more is, you know, what impact does primary care have on those quality measures and, and how, how are we seeing it in the in the data that we have? Um, very exciting this year is really looking at how where you live impacts the quality of care that you might be receiving. And that that I think is uh, going to help us really dive into the data a little bit more over the next couple of years to work with communities, work with provider groups, work with health plans in terms of how do we um, really understand what's going on in a community, what barriers exist, and how do we start um, um, uh, measuring, measuring that. Um, So let's uh, let's move forward, and I'm not sure how I I keep getting a little tone there, but I don't know how to turn it off, so I apologize for that. But um, so let's talk about the community checkup. Community checkup has almost a little over four million members in it. Uh, when we receive that information, it's blinded to PHI. Uh, we get it from 30 different suppliers. Um, it this encompasses the full year 2021. Uh, both on the Medicaid and commercial side. Um, and what we can compare is we can compare those two different insurance types, but we don't have information such as what's the plan design, what's the deductibles and, and things like that. Uh, we do compare uh, our quality results uh, to NCQA. Uh, and we'll look at that. And then the new pieces in this report, um, uh, claims, um, uh, and that are where you have had some claims, but no PCP attributes to you, and the neighborhood atlas that I mentioned um, uh, as well. And I'm just trying to confirm that uh, people can see the the slides, and if not, then um, uh, I, I'm getting sort of a combination of yes and no. So. Um, OK. No slides, yes slides, no slides, OK. Well, let me um, let me try something a little different in terms of how I'm uh, presenting this, and I'm going to stop sharing that way. I'm going to see if I can share it. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if this is better. OK, that one worked great. Now, when we when we've looked at the um, community checkup in the past, one of the things that we've looked at is 
uh, the quality of care. And when the Alliance started in 2004, 2005, you know, our whole focus was how do we improve the quality of care that should then result in both affordability and a better member experience and access and um, um, and someone's asking if I can silence my teams and I have no idea how to do that. So I, I apologize for that. Um, but let's look at uh, the quality of care. We've presented this for a number of years in sort of this format. Format. We have over 100 measures on our quality scorecard uh, and we compare those to where they fall in terms of uh, the NCQA benchmarks. Uh, the first one is really looking at commercially insured uh, business. We have um, currently 81% of the measures are below the 50th percentile. I'll say that again, 81% below the 50th percentile. Almost 60% are in that 25% or below. Um, people have always asked, well, how did it look in prior years? And in prior years, we we looked um, similar, um, but we've been falling behind the rest of the country in terms of um, our ability to score well in these areas. And there's probably a, a couple of reasons and we'll go through that. On the Medicaid side, it's similar, a little bit better than on the commercial side. Um, but even in that area, I think we have some, some work, to, um, work to go in terms of that. Um, the other thing that we presented last year was related to um, the total cost of care. And the total cost of care uh, can be seen in this way. Um, uh, this is the commercial side. You can see um, that facilities, both inpatient and outpatient, represent almost half of the cost, whereas pro professional, ancillary, and pharmaceuticals are the other half. Um, that is not too dissimilar, and in our report, uh, you can go in and you can find all the details underneath each of these. So for a facility, is it surgical? Is it non-surgical? Is it maternity, et cetera, um, to get a little bit more clarity. Uh, very similar uh, in terms of the Medicaid uh, side. And I'm going to move this out of the way. Um, Medicaid is, um, you know, has a different cost structure and also a very different population, more women who are having babies, more children on that plan. But those who take medications, they're going to have uh, a very similar um, uh, similar cost uh, as well. And if you're asking questions, I probably can't read them fast enough, so I apologize. Uh, and we'll try to get to those maybe in a follow up or a follow up um, uh, email to, to folks. Um, this is how the total cost of care report looked uh, last year. This is how it looks this year. You can see up at the top, you can sort by the, the report year. You can sort by whether you want commercial or Medicaid. And for me, I, I like looking at commercial. I look at county. I look at commercial because we are a purchaser led organization uh, looking at what their cost might be. But the other thing you'll see in here is you'll see a couple of differences um, in terms of there's a, a cost component. There's also a risk level. So if we looked right about in the middle of the state, Douglas County, you'll see that it's high cost, but it's also high risk area. And so that that sort of makes sense, right? A higher risk population has a higher cost. That would make, make sense to us. Um, you can look in the bottom uh, part of the state in Cowlitz, and then you can see they have a lower risk population and a lower cost. And that would also uh, tend to make sense. Uh, each of those you would want to, to know a little bit more about your population, a, a little bit more about what's causing the, those high risk, what is causing the, the high cost. But there's a couple other uh, parts of the state where there's a little bit of a mismatch. So Spokane, very low cost, higher risk level. So they're doing something different in Spokane um, to manage that risk than in other locations. And so where are those costs? Where are we seeing an improvement in costs uh, in Spokane as compared to maybe um, some of the other uh, locations, even a Cowlitz um, County as an example. And then the other one, uh, it's sort of the opposite of that. You would see a high cost, but a low risk, and you wouldn't expect that, right? So you would wanna look uh, for Whatcom County, a lot of their costs are on the professional side. So office visits, 
uh, physician office visit, physician facilities, et cetera, tend to drive those costs as well as some of the facility outpatient uh, costs as well. The other piece to this is where you can do sorting and you can sort by uh, accountable community of health, you can sort by county, which I've done here, and you can sort by uh, medical group or even medical clinics. Um, so on the, the first column here, I sorted by quality composite score. That's what the quality improvement committee defined as sort of that percentile ranking uh, of the different entity that you're measuring uh, to the state average. So Thurston County in this case has, has come up to the top. On the right hand set of um, columns, I've looked at, I've sorted by cost because I was more interested in where the costs of care are occurring. When you really start looking at, you know, what county in this case might have the best value, the, the best quality, lowest cost structure. And I, I'm going to give the, the winner to Thurston County in this case, because Thurston still had a pretty good uh, price point. Although you could probably say, well, Spokane and maybe Walla Walla should should be included in that. And one way to look at that is in what we call a scatter plot. And scatter plot puts all of this on one grid. In this case, again, commercial, county based. And if you're in the upper left, uh, you'll tend to have higher quality and a lower cost structure. And you can look at this on the commercial side. You can look at it on the Medicaid side. And as you can see, you could choose by clinic, medical group, or even ACH. And so that may help you sort of understand maybe something's going on differently in those areas, or uh, there's really a little bit more value associated with, with some of these areas as well. Um, but one of the questions that we, we wanted to ask is what, what is the impact on, on primary care? How does that impact quality? And new to the report this year is really looking at what happens when someone has a PCP or doesn't have a PCP? And there's a question a number of years ago in some of the research studies looking at uh, primary care and does, and when someone says, I have a PCP, do they actually have one? About 70% of the time they thought they had a PCP, but they were seeing a specialist or someone who was not in, in primary care. So some people may think they have a PCP, but don't. But within our data, we, we've looked at it a couple of different ways. And one is, when you look at commercial enrollees, we have about 20% of the population that has claims that are occurring during the course of the year. It could be a medication refill, an emergency room visit. Maybe they're just seeing a specialist, but no PCP that they can attribute to. So that's about 20%, but about almost you know 14%, a little bit more than that, actually have no claims at all during the course of the year. That doesn't look very different than the Medicaid population with, again, about 20% have some form of a claim, but have no PCP that can attribute uh, to their care. So they're seeing, they're getting care at some point, but they're not necessarily getting uh, care from a primary care uh, practice. So what we wanted to do then is let's um, let's create a, a, a score then for those, that population. You're getting care. Uh, you have some claims, but you don't have a PCP. And we took a couple of the clinical measures, so breast cancer screening, et cetera, which you can read. We have the state average there, which um, certainly could be better, when, especially when you look at it compared to the rest of the country. Um, and certainly when you look at what our goal was, which is the 90th percentile. But there are practices around the state that are doing an excellent job, and you can see that in the best in, in state category, all well above the 90th percentile. So we know that uh, this type of care can be delivered in a, in a pretty robust way. But if you don't have a claim, uh, or you have claims but no PCP, what happens to those numbers? And here's where you start seeing a really huge drop off in terms of the, the quality of care that you're receiving um, when you're having claims but no, but don't really have a primary care doc. You know, only about a third are getting appropriate cancer uh, screens. Even the diabetics who are, are getting care, uh, they're falling well below the best in the state, obviously, and, and below uh, what we see as a state average. And you can read the other ones. So having a PCP uh, does appear to matter quite a bit. And those best in state um, practices are really what we, we want to get to. So 
when you think about who's best in class within uh, the state, we thought we would just uh, highlight who those uh, practices are. It's by the raw number, not the confidence intervals. So yes, there'll be some that are pretty close, but I chose the, the those practices that had, uh, you know, really the top score. And you can see that there are practices that are doing something very different than the rest um, uh, of the state in general. So he, as, at the top one, Eastside Family Medicine, 91% uh, of their folks are being uh, screened for breast cancer uh, as compared to 67% within the state. That's a pretty remarkable number. You can see on the diabetes, there were three clinics that actually scored 96% as compared to 83%, which is the state average. All of those are above that 94, uh, that 90th percentile, uh, which is really where we we're trying to get as a, as a state. On the Medicaid side, you see similar remarkable um, improvements. So those practices do something different. Uh, they, they are managing a population. They are bringing those patients in to be be screened and you can see a few of these uh, results here that are you know very similar to the commercial side uh, for Medicaid there's no um, heat is ranking on colon cancer that's why that one's blank um, but then we took this this information we said well what about um, what happens when you you know d does where you live really matter and so we wanted to apply um, information that can help us start learning a little bit more about that. We asked our data suppliers to provide us uh, information on uh, the location of where people live. And that's, uh, we applied this uh, concept through uh, the Neighborhood Atlas, which came out of the University of Wisconsin, really takes the HRSA work from a couple of decades ago, looking at the county level, but really brings it down to the very much the neighborhood level. Uh, it's you speak, it's sometimes called the Area Deprivation Index um, as well. Um, it's been looked at in a number of different ways to validate um, that process. There are multiple different domains in there, income, education, employment, the quality of housing. Uh, what's not in there would be race, ethnicity, and language. Um, and you say, well, then it, is it valid or not? Uh, in the United States, it's it's probably more valid than it would be in other places because we do have a very uh, structural segregation within a number of our neighborhoods. Also, this has been validated and correlated with health outcomes. So we wanted to see uh, how does it correlate uh, within the state of Washington. And this is the content of that area deprivation index. You can find it on their, their site, but you'll see things like education level, age of the population, percent living in poverty, et cetera. It helps to define the areas um, by probably the more advantaged versus those that are the more deprived areas. And when you look at that um, as a state, here's how we would look compared to the rest of the country. Blue being uh, more advantaged, red being uh, the least advantaged or the more deprived areas. But you can also, uh, take this, and these are broken out into deciles, so uh, one through ten. Uh, you can also look at it as a state compared to our cells, and um, that you start seeing a, a much starker uh, look. You start seeing the rural counties um, uh, potentially having more difficulty than some of the urban counties, and that can certainly impact um, you know, the care received, whether that's just plain distance uh, to travel to get care or just the accessibility within those different counties to the type of care that you need. And when we look at that, we, we also wanted to then make it available to um, the population to start getting an idea of what uh, what this means in Washington and where it might be of issue and how you might then uh, jump into the data and and start looking at it. So when you go into our report, you'll see a, a page that looks like this. You'll be able to choose by commercial type, uh, et cetera. I chose the state. I chose both commercial and Medicaid. You can choose what category you want to look at and, and what types of deciles. I chose one through 10 because I want to look at everything. 
Um, and you also see a little legend over here that will show you that blue is commercial, orange is Medicaid, and then you'll see the results uh, down below. And here just happened to be a couple of them looking at prescriptions and generic prescriptions. And you might go, well, uh, what am I seeing there? Well, the, the solid lines are the state average. Uh, the squiggly lines are where people fall within those different deciles. And you might think that there's a big difference between these two. Oh my goodness, look at commercial well above um, the Medicaid, but that's actually not true because you have to also look at the rate here. And and actually everyone's falling in the upper 99% uh, range. So almost everyone's getting exactly the same care, although it looks like there's a, a difference. It's not a statistical difference. But in other areas, you will see a difference. And let's look at those. So now I took the same, um, same look, but I looked at only commercial. I was wanting to look at cancer screenings because we saw those before that there's a possibility of um, you know some differences there. I can also choose uh, to look at whether they're above or below the say just makes it a little easier to, to look at and I'll just um, go in a little bit more. but this is commercial. this is all the state breast cancer screening in the the more affluent areas, almost 75 percent of women are being screened. but as you go into those, uh, lower deciles, only 61%. So where you live appears to have a big difference on whether you're being screened. And these are people that are covered by commercial insurance. The same is true on, on cervical cancer screening. But let's look at a couple others because we were talking about diabetes before. Again, looking at Washington, this is whether people got a hemoglobin A1C. Uh, these are the, the best in states, so we know statewide we can do pretty well um, and then you can see the state average and you, you'll notice something that maybe looks a little unusual and you'll say well why is this number the average so much lower than the the line we're seeing and it's only a function of uh, not having adi information on a hundred percent of that population first year we did it we had a couple of the medicaid plans that were unable to uh, send us the ADI information this year. I'm sure they will be able to by next year. So that's why you may see a difference in that. Um, not so much of a difference on the commercial side, but that's why you might see something that looks different there. But when you look at this information, um, in the more affluent areas, the more privileged areas, if you will, or the least deprived areas, uh, it doesn't look like there's any difference whether you've got Medicaid or commercial for this uh, measure, they all look kind of the same. But as we go farther down in that de area deprivation index, it starts to widen out a little bit. So since I live in King County, I said, well, let me see what's going on in, in uh, the county that I live to see if the, the same pattern holds true. And when I look at that, uh, I see something a little different. So here I see the more advantaged areas, Medicaid does better than commercial, not a lot, um, but it, it's still there. But then something very unusual happens. And in the uh, the lower uh, ADI indexes, um, Medicaid drops, which you might have predicted. You might have said, well, yeah, it's, it's gonna be a little harder in, in some of those areas. Uh, maybe there's some other reasons for that. But commercial actually went up in those areas. so. If I'm looking at that, it makes me want to try to understand what's going on in those parts of King County where maybe there it's either a provider or it's uh, a social determinant of health, transportation, uh, distance to a to a provider, et cetera, um, that may be impacting that. Or maybe it's just uh, language and culture and, and difficulty, you know, getting that population in. This doesn't give us the answer, but it gives us a place to look. Uh, also, there's been studies where they've taken the ADI and added in race, ethnicity, and language. And they find that that even heightens uh, some of the information that we're seeing here. So having that information in the database eventually will, will help us uh, answer more questions than we can today, but this certainly gives us a place to, to start. Now, let me give you one more, uh, and then I'm going to open it up to uh, having a conversation with some of our, our directors. 
Um, this one is really looking at um, chlamydia screening and um, uh, chlamydia screening should be done on any um, young woman between the ages of 16 to 24 who are sexually active, which um, puts a confounding um, uh, component in there or variable in there where the provider has to determine whether the person is sexually active or not. Uh, this is a, an area being taken up by our uh, Quality Improvement Committee because the numbers are relatively low. So you can see, you know, the, the heatest numbers, uh, we're running about 37 to, to 45 uh, percent. Best in class is, is way up there. This, this should say this is our state average. Uh, and you can see those right here. Um, the heatest 90th percentile numbers are in the 60s. Um, so we have a ways to go to get there. But the literature would also tell you that that something happens here. And when you look at King County, uh, you could look at the state. It will be very similar numbers. Uh, Medicaid uh, populations get screened at a higher rate than uh, commercial in general. And you can see that with the state average numbers being very different uh, as well. Uh, why does that occur? Um, because of this variable in here that you are trying to, as a provider, make a determination on whether someone is sexually active or not. Uh, best practice is you screen everybody. Uh, but if you're trying to make a choice, now you've got a preference that occurs or a bias that's uh, included in there. And as you go from the more um, advantageous areas to the least advantageous areas, uh, it's very interesting that commercial then matches um, the, the Medicaid population. And there's very good uh, you, uh, literature that would show you that um, you're going to screen at a higher rate for this measure if um, the screening population is um, lower income uh, or a different color than the, the provider that's um, uh, doing the care. And so brown, black, Asian, uh, you'll see higher rates of screening than you will in a typical Caucasian population. So that's an, a bias that um, you can start seeing within um, uh, this information as well. What I'd like to do at this point is um, stop and and uh, ask Denise and Sharon to come in and uh, I will um, stop um, sharing and um, we're going to have a conversation and a conversation about what we should do, uh, what are you seeing in the data and what what really should we be doing in the future uh, based on on some of the information um, that we that we're seeing in here and um, and go from there. So I'm going to stop presenting and um, ask Denise and Sharon to come in. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, you saw Mark's name on there. Mark uh, got ill and has a cough and is unable to talk. So I'm going to try to fill in for Mark uh, if possible. Um, uh, but one of the, the first areas was, um, you know, this information where there's there's no PCP and and we saw that the results were um, certainly worse in general for people without an attributed PCP versus those with and and so I'll I'll ask Sharon um, if and and you know as a pediatrician and head of our quality improvement uh, area are, are you surprised by that and and what implications do you do you think might uh, you you take away from that. Well, I, I have to say that I, I actually am surprised at the percentage of folks um, for whom we have information that don't have an attributed usual source of primary care. Um, I know that our healthcare system in Washington State is, is set up right now so that um, selection of a primary care provider isn't required um, by many of our health plans, but it still did surprise me. Um, what I would say that I'm not surprised about at all is that the lack of a primary care provider or usual source of care is associated with poor performance on our metrics. Um, assignment to a primary care provider led team. So you're usually assigned or to a primary care provider, but think of it as being assigned to the entire team that works with that primary care provider is really the cornerstone 
to achieving everything that we think of when we think of what used to be called, I guess, person-centered medical home, but now we're talking about advanced um, primary care, that is being able to do things such as arrive at enhanced access. We can eliminate a lot of access problems if we had um, attribution to primary care providers. Um, the ability to have team-based care so that the provider doesn't have to do everything, but that again increases access um, for patients. Um, it allows for continuous patient-centered healing relationships and the ability of that team to provide evidence-based care because they can have a commonly understood quality improvement strategy and get those gaps closed. So unfortunately, I'm surprised about the large numbers that are not attributed, but not surprised that the lack thereof is causing these problems that we see. And then Denise, when you think about the the, the purchaser community, um, uh, is there's, you know, we're seeing lower PCP, you know, at, you know, people being attributed. What should a, how should a purchaser look at this and how should they think about, about that? Well, the, the, the one effective way of addressing this that we know of um, from past experience is requiring your employees to choose a PCP at the time of enrollment. And we moved away from that because um, employees wanted to maintain choice. I think they, they were feeling pressured. Um, they were choosing PCPs um, because they had to, right, in the moment um, without being able, having the opportunity to do some research and even know if that PCP was taking new patients. So, um, so incentives haven't worked in the past. Um, but I still think requiring you know, a member to, to choose a PCP, but we need to take um, a, a better, more informed approach um, to that. Uh, and actually doing a better job of informing our members, right, um, at the time of enrollment for them to be able to um, feel good about the, the choice that they're making and understand why it's so important. Yeah, I think the the why, you know, is, is has been pretty clear in the literature for, you know, decades now. I think we're seeing it in our data as well, certainly from a, you know, quality standpoint. But you're right, there's, you know, a bunch of noise associated with that. If you're the HR person, people might complain about it. Um, but if you want to have the best care, having someone, you know, have a usual source of care really matters and and you know it just seems like you would want you know your employees and their families to uh to make sure that they're they're signed up with someone rather than wait till later and not have any place to go right yeah and and you and i understand the the value in that but i think the average person who's um signing on to receive their benefits does not fully understand it now, um, you know, maybe it's a question for Denise or and or Sharon, but, you know, we had a number of the health plans uh, come through in the last couple of weeks and they they talked to us and, a, and our purchaser uh, community about what they're doing, you know, as a health plan, but also specifically about advanced primary care. Um, what do we hear about from them in terms of how they're going to approach um, you know, get more people assigned to either assigned to a primary care doc or some payment, you know, reform, et cetera. Did anything come out that was, you know, that that jumped out at you that we should share with the, the rest of the community? Well, we, we did have a couple of health plans say that they're investing in this, right? Um, Regents in particular um, has stepped up to invest money in um, provider organizations to help them move along in that primary care model, the the advanced primary care model. Um, so I was I was happy to hear that. Um, there are some there are some health plans um, that have some solutions that have partnered with primary care providers. Um, you have to contract with them to access those. So that's that's the downside to it. 
um, in that we're not making those practices available to all. Um, it's just the members um, who, within, that yeah, health who, plan. within that health plan. Yeah. Yeah, I think we heard that from um, Premier with their Kinwell product, but we also know, you know, Aetna and Crossover and, you know, some of the other ones uh, coming, you know, bringing into the market. But we've also heard from some of the larger jumbo um, employers um, trying to make sure that their members have access to primary care, either partnering with, you know, a primary care group or even purchasing, you know, a big primary care group to ensure that their employees get access. Um, On-site and near-site clinics, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think it's safe to say, I think it's publicly known that Boeing is launching a pilot where they've added an additional level where the members, when they're referred to a specialist, they're, um, there's going to be like a quality check, right? They're, they're referring them out to the best quality um, uh, specialists within their network. So that's another dimension to that model. And I think, I think all those can, you know, help with that sort of the quality areas. But, you know, as we saw earlier in in uh, the presentation, uh, the quality of care in, in this in the state uh, continues to to slip. And maybe I'll just tag uh, Sharon on this one, but you know prov there are providers in the state that are doing an excellent job. And I know you ran a number of collaboratives, you know, beginning you know 25 years ago, uh, you know, with the Diabetes Collaborative. You work with um, you know, other entities, you know, up till now. Um, what what do you think those providers are doing differently than the, the state average? And how can how can others kind of work their way, you know, to be more like uh, those top performers in the state? Well, I, I did want to add in um, just a comment on something else that we heard when we had some of our um, health plans and I just wanted to point out some of the things that we heard from, for example, Kaiser Permanente, and we know, and you can all look at this up when you go out um, and look at the full report on wacommunitycheckup.org, but you can see that the Kaiser clinics tend to come in in terms of a big system, uh, pretty, pretty much on top of our quality measures. And they talked about primary care being the foundational unit, integrated, digital, equitable, and ahead. And the provider and payer are the same. And I think that makes a huge difference. And I know we talked about some experiments and um, progress going on with some of our other insurers to move to a per member per month type of arrangement, um, kind of working on that. But I think that will help a lot. Um, I would say with regard to the quality scores slipping, I will give a little tiny excuse to the fact that we're looking at 2021 information, which is still technically during the pandemic. And we may see ourselves regress or progress a little bit back up to our the mean when we get there next year, but that will still be not terribly good as Drew's talked about. Um, I would say that the organizations that are doing well um, are probably focusing on a few impactful metrics. So you can't work on 41, 64, 120 things at once. You know, we have a state um, measure set, we have Everything that's in heat is you can't work on everything all at once, but the techniques that you use to work on those should be fundamental and primarily the same. It needs a concerted effort. And again, think about just some of those metrics that are clinically impactful, that have equity impacts that we just looked at. For example, the, the cancer screenings, colorectal cancer screening, breast cancer, cervical cancer, probably that hemoglobin A1C. All of those, if missed, can really cause problems and see what you can do in terms of really just working on regular old basic gap closure techniques. I would guess that the organizations that do well on our metrics use their electronic health record not only to put stuff into it, but to pull stuff out. So they know and they use the information in the EHR to identify um, gaps in patient care and understand who those patients are and use that information to reach out to those patients within their patient portals and other means to contact them and encourage them to come in for the screenings they need. They use that information also when a person comes in, maybe just because they're having a sick visit, 
so that the medical assistant, the team, you know, the provider, the entire team knows that this person, say Sharon, me, is coming in because I have a sore throat today, but I also could, I, I need to have the colorectal cancer screening, you know, done now. Maybe I'm behind. I haven't had my A1C checked yet this year. They know those gaps. They are right there and they can act on them during that visit regardless of whether it was something that I was called in for or not. So they, they know where the gaps are and they know how to do it. Um, I would say this does go back to the need for primary care provider and team assignment. If you don't have it, then you're random every time you come in, basically. Um, I do want to say that one thing that we need to pay attention to is that information that Drew shared with us about the area deprivation index and those areas where we're seeing um, poor care delivered to people that live in less advantaged areas. And that requires an approach to not only gap closures, but understanding why some people in your population are not as able to have those gaps closed as others are. And that approach is generally called now targeted universalism. So you have your universal approach, which is we close gaps this way. We follow this quality improvement methodology. This is how we close the gaps and we know who our population is, and we know some of the stresses that they're under, and we work very hard to understand our communities and to provide targeted attempts to help them close those gaps. So really that that concept of identifying the, the people that may have the greatest barriers, but as you do that, you kind of raise everybody up uh, to a, a score level, rather than just focusing on the really compliant population are are the ones that happen to you know always do everything you're you know you tell them to do but as you know you and i when we trained in med school they they told us pretty clearly that you know half the people won't do what you tell them to do so um or take their medications or whatever it might be yeah. um yeah. when people don't do what the healthcare system wants them to do it usually means they don't understand that the healthcare system hasn't done a good enough job of helping understand what they think and, and how they believe about that information. And they they generally just need more. Um, yeah, and I, I would also say that the rising tide doesn't affect all boats equally. And I think our ADI data shows that, that yes, on the, the ground floor is getting those gap closure strategies straight but bringing everybody up to the same is going to require additional and different efforts for people that have additional barriers in front of them. So it's really bringing in the, the community as well as the provider community um, to start addressing some of those things that are much farther upstream or barriers that, you know, you know, as clinicians, we typically, that's not in our scope, um, but clearly is impacting, impacting our members. You know, and you talked about a lot of the information that's in the report in terms of how a provider might use it. Denise, let me ask you this in terms of, you know, there, there's a lot in there. How would a how would a purchaser think about using, you know, some of the data that's in the community checkup to help them with their population and or the design of their their health plan? Yeah, I mean, you know, going back to, you know, attribution to a PCP. So we we know that that's something for them to look at, right? What percent of their population is attributed to a PCP? What plans do they have in place? Which which of their plans are most successful in getting their members engaged? And and then what can they learn from that, right? And, and apply that um, across their population to increase um, PCP choice or, um, or them to attributing. Um, Looking at the high value, low or lower cost, right? So um, looking at provider systems, um, health systems that are within your network, how are they ranking in the report, right? And then using that for a discussion, going back to um, your, your carrier, your ASO, having a conversation with them um, about who's in your network, um, potentially going straight to those providers and sitting down and talking with them and and saying um, if it's a quality issue, uh, how, you know, how can we support you? What do we need to do to to move this along um, and have the discussions about 
um, alternate payment models, right? Would, would that help? Um, jo joining with the Alliance to have those discussions, right? So that it's a, it can be a larger discussion with other purchasers where that's of interest. Um, but, but working to hold everyone in the system accountable um, and purchasers themselves too, holding themselves accountable, right? What's, what's their part in this? Um, how are they setting up their copay structures? How are they setting up their networks? Um, how can they help with getting their, their members to um, right care, right time, lowest cost? Yeah, and there and there's certainly, you know, differences whether your um, your employees are in an urban area versus a rural area versus, you know, some place that may have sort of a provider desert, if you will, um, that yeah. that may need to be addressed. They, they, do they need to put support ser services in, right? Do they, yep, connect them with community support? Yeah. How do they work Let, with the providers in that? Yeah. So you talked a little bit about sort of, you know, from a purchaser's perspective, you need, um, you know, a number of, you know, different people working together, right? You need plans working together, community working together, providers working together. Um, if you were, you know, if you could get um, the plans and the providers in the same room and you and you could say, OK, uh, we need to close some of these care gaps and we still got to mitigate our cost trends because I'm going broke here. What would you want them to do? Um, I, I'm well, I, I would want them to to come to an agreement. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes, we will work on that. Um, and how how they attain that can happen in you know different different manners. It just it depends. Um, I, I I think to get health plans to change how they're contracting um, would take more than one employer sitting at the table with them. Right. Um, but I, I do think that um, we need to look at the payment models and even where the payment models are out there, right? Where they're in existence, um, are we accessing them? Are we making sure that those providers are included in our, in our network? Um, and um, looking at, at the provider side on, is there are there efficiencies that can be attained, right? How do we help you to get to that place? Um, I think just open discussion on what everyone's challenges are and where their strengths are and how we come together and make it all work. Great, thanks. Hey, Sharon, a uh, similar question. So if you're a provider and now you're sitting in the room and you've got employers and health plans in front of you, and you know you want you want to improve quality, you, you want to improve affordability, but you you need the employers and the plans to do something for you. What would you ask them? Well, I, I think based on what I've heard from our quality improvement committee and others across the umpty years, that um, I would say that provider perspective, particularly with regard to um, these outpatient metrics, I'm not going to speak anything about hospital or whatever, but I would say that um, at the at the front line there, they would really appreciate it if purchasers would work with their health plans and to push them a little bit further in terms of strongly encouraging, I can't say requiring, but strongly encouraging the selection of a primary care provider for the members. Um, I would also say that um, our provider groups seem to really want to move away from being paid for, you know, for doing stuff, for seeing 30 patients a day, and would prefer to move to a risk bearing per member per month or capitated agreement with regard to these types of things. It it is really difficult. I mean it's positive. It's positive right now that some of the um, payer organizations are moving in that direction and experimenting with some capitated arrangements. It is really hard to do the real work of primary care when you have any element of the fee for service reimbursement in it. Um, once you have one payer that you're accepting that is paying for 
you know, RVU or or visits, number of visits per day, then it it really takes all of the oomph out of the fact that maybe some of the pairs are paying capitated. So they would be um I would be asking for that. I would say, um, yeah, that, I think so. And they would like also to have us all kind of settle on a standardized, more concise measure set, because it really is impossible in the work of a day to focus on, oh, health plan A wants these things to be focused on health plan B wants these things because they do not think about it in that way. Um, so it would be nice to have things a little bit more, a little bit more standardized. I, I want to actually answer something really quick about access with regard to establish with the primary care provider. And I know it's very difficult right now. We do have issues with, um, you know, providers left the system during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I also feel like um, our provider systems have really worked hard to try to develop other means of access. So you can have a video visit. You could have a virtual visit. You can use email and the definition of access is is starting to broaden, but even so, having an assignment to a primary care provider and a team would probably help that regardless. And again, having a primary care provider and impaneling to that provider and having a capitated payment arrangement does actually allow for the system to have more access because it, it allows you to know the supply and demand of how many slots you actually have available and how much the demand is. And when you can't match that, then it's just be, it becomes random and many providers will be booked out for months and you might not even know that 20 percent of those people are going to no show it. Yeah. It's chaotic. Think, Our uh, system is a mess. Yeah, what I've heard from a number of providers is um, sort of that desire to do, you know, population health management. Um, but also that, that having that consistent revenue stream, as you mentioned, um, is really important. Uh, the pandemic certainly exacerbated that for for everybody in terms of all of a sudden there was a drop in revenue when you're in a fee for service world. That's what's going to happen uh, in a capitation world that wouldn't happen. It also allows for other ways that you could um, deliver care, um, given that you still have resources available to you. Um, but that's going to take some work to to get some of the practices up. Um, uh, to be able to manage a population when they've been, you know, frankly, uh, incented to do a fee for service model. And, um, you know, I don't certainly have all the answers. And I think when you look at the consolidation, certain whoever bought certain practices may continue to want to have that revenue stream in a fee for service uh, world continue um, and others won't. Although I, I would think it's going to be better for the majority, if we can move toward a more accountable um, organization that really takes care of the entire population, that's accountable for the care, accountable for the, the costs as well, as a way to start um, reducing some of the harassment of factors <laughs> that may, uh, may occur from, you know, UM and other things like that, let me do it as a provider if I'm accountable for the, the quality and the cost, and that should should work out. But you've got to be ramped up to be able to do that. You can't just turn things off and, and hope for the best. We did that in the 90s and uh, as an IPA and lost a lot of money. Um, so we need, need to fix that. Um, what would be I know interesting, we, Drew, is um, yeah, go ahead, that there's a question here, is burnout damaging quality? Um, and it would be interesting to see um, it's a good question to ask, but also um, who experienced greater burnout? The, the provider models where they were capitated, right? Or the pro provider models where they were not? And then how did that impact quality? Yeah, and I would think burnout impacted, you know, providers across the country. Um, and, you know, our results didn't change a lot from the prior year. Or the year before that, or the year before that, they they worsen compared to the national numbers. Uh, was the you know state of Washington more adversely affected than other states? You know, I don't I don't know that information. Um, you know, and maybe next year when we look at the data, like Sharon mentioned, that maybe we start coming back to um, you know sort of our our more baseline 
uh, areas, but we certainly know that um, healthcare workers across the country were impacted. And certainly we saw systems here in Washington where they lost you know, 20% of their workers, which included uh, providers as well as nurses and well as other folks. So it, it's not a, a small issue that um, that that's in there. Um, there's tons of comments that are you know flying in. I, I love the the interaction. I just can't read them all. Um, and we're getting uh, close to um, you know to to the end of our our time. I think what I'll I'll do with that is you know make sure we we end with just a you know a couple minutes uh, left for folks and. Um, you know, one just a reminder about some of the activities that we continue to do. Uh, one of the things that will be really, um, you know, interesting um, is uh, we're taking that ADI data. We're going to also apply it to the total cost of care question. Uh, preliminarily, um, when you look across those different deciles, the cost doesn't, you know, overall from a PMPM standpoint, change a whole lot, goes up a little bit in the more uh, deprived areas. But when you really look at that data, what we start to see is that more and more people are getting having no claims uh, in, in those uh, difficult areas. And when they do have claims, more facility claims, more inpatient, more outpatient facility like ERs and, and otherwise. So they're getting more intensity of service, uh, which tells me that they may have been delaying care uh, that could have been occurring earlier. So we'll have a, a little bit more of that in May. We're, we're bringing people together uh, to work on that. Um, and we, we want a robust um, discussion on that. Uh, I didn't want to stop without talking about behavioral health and we're having a behavioral health forum on June 14th. So look out for that. We still have a number of projects uh, working uh, with um, the Foundation for Healthcare Quality. We have uh, a meeting coming up on the 9th, but we also have other uh, things that we're engaging with them on, as well as ongoing uh, alliance uh, projects that you can you can see down below. And then uh, just to finish up, because I know we're uh, at time, is, is if you're not a member of the alliance, um, we'd love to have a conversation with you about uh, joining the alliance. Um, you know, I think what we can do is we can um, be, you know, an independent uh, source, uh, both for the public reporting that we're doing, but also, as Denise mentioned, as we can get enough um, entities together to start having those difficult conversations, we can really start to drive the market and really create value for, um, you know, all Washingtonians, not not just those that are the more privileged ones or those that are employed, but really all of them. And regardless of where you live and start understanding uh, those pieces. So the more we can engage, the more we can improve quality, the more we can improve affordability, the more we can help all Washingtonians. And and I think that effort is is why we come to work every day. And and one of the reasons that we um, you know, are so positive about the alliance and the and the work that and the mission that we have uh, going forward. And with that, I want to thank you for um, joining us today. Uh, the reports are now live uh, that you may go out and you may look at that. If you have questions, please let us know. For those who are alliance members uh, who have other questions or maybe want a specific report, uh, feel free to to contact us and we can. Uh, dive into that data a little bit more. The ADI information will be um, may show up blank if there's not mem enough members in each uh, decile for you. So that might be the reason why we can start piecing through that a little bit. Uh, but thank you again. Thanks for the support of the Alliance and I uh, hope you have a, a wonderful rest of your day.